The Mac Observer's Mac Geek Gab, episode 739 for Monday, December 10th, 2018. <laughs> to the Mac Observer's Mac Geek Gab, the show where we take your questions, your tips, your cool stuff found that you send in to us here at feedback at macgeekgab.com, and we share them. We answer the questions, we share your tips, we share your cool stuff found. The goal being each and every one of us learns at least five new things every single time we get together. Sponsors for this episode include BB Edit at barebones.com, Ops Genie now from Atlassian at OpsGenie.com. Jamf now at Jamf.com slash MGG. And 100 bucks off of uh, an Eero system with a base unit, two beacons, and a year of Eero Plus at Eero.com slash MGG. We'll talk more about all of that shortly here, here in Durham, New Hampshire. I'm Dave Hamilton. And here in Fairfield, Connecticut, this is, yet again, John F. Braun. How you doing, Mr. John F. Braun? Staying warm. Just warm, huh? Yeah, not hot. Not like red fish bone. No, not like red fish bone. So, huh. All right. Well. Nobody knows what we're talking about. No one knows. No, we don't know what we're talking about when we talk about red fish bone is hot. That was a thing somebody said at Apple Fest, like, I don't know, 100 years ago, in the middle of the night. It was Glenn. Wasn't he? The was sysop he climbing on, on like cars. So yeah, like Glenn the sysop from the Spectrum was drunk and climbing cars in Boston and ranting that red fishbone <laughs> is hot. That is exactly what was happening. I don't to this day. I knew in the moment I wouldn't under ever understand it, and and that has proven true. So there you go. I think it was a modification of uh, it, it was one of the uh, somebody on a, a Budweiser commercial. I think. Right? Uh, that's what you've said. I, I've found nothing to corroborate that over the years. So, okay. Yeah. You know. Uh, okay. Shall we, uh, shall we get to our first question here, John? We have all kinds of stuff today. Certainly. All right. Uh, the first question is from Mike who says, uh, lately on my iPhone, I've had these things popping up where it says sign in required, enter the password for, and it lists, he says, his Gmail address. Um, what is it that's requiring the password? Because he says that is the email that I use for my Apple ID, but it's also used anywhere that an email re address was requested. He says, as far as I know, I'm logged in to my Apple ID. I clearly don't want to provide a password to anything that I don't understand. There are no apps that aren't working as far as I know. And the two screenshots he sent are interesting. One is inside messages. It looks like he's getting this thing popping up saying sign in required. And the other is on his lock screen. And the context of these messages is important. We've talked about this on the show before because it is possible for a web page to make it seem like it is to generate something that seems like a legitimate Apple, um, you know, uh, generated re request like the one that iOS would actually generate. But if you're not on a website, so if you're on a website and you see this, it's it's good to be suspect of it, right? Because it's possible that the website generated it. So if you're inside Safari and iOS, that could be probably isn't, but could be something nefarious. However, if it's showing up inside messages and especially showing up on your lock screen, looking like an iOS thing, it's an iOS thing. Your lock screen will always make it clear what app is asking for stuff unless it's simply not an app. So in your case, Mike, I think there's something in the background on iOS that uh, is re is requesting this, a an iOS service. It could very well be messages, right? Because it popped up while you were in messages. Maybe it needs it for iMessage for some reason. Or it could be, you know, FaceTime or one of the uh, like the iTunes store or the app store. It could be uh, it could be any one of those things. So thoughts on this, John? Every now and then I'll get a prompt to enter my password yeah, it happens. for one of my emails. Oh, okay. and usually I just ignore oh. it. 
Sometimes that's different. Old, yeah, right. Yeah, the, at least the, you know, like my my non Apple email accounts. Every every once in a blue moon, it'll come up and say, "Hey, give me the password for this account." And I'm like, "Well, no." And yeah. I dismiss it, and then and then things settle down. So sometimes it's a hiccup with a, uh, you know, a hiccup with something. That's true, you know. And his being that it just says sign in required, enter the password for, and then list his Gmail address, which I'm not going to uh, share. Um, that might be exactly what he's seeing here: is that it's having trouble logging into Gmail and is asking for that password, and then maybe, like you said. If he ignores it like you did, you know, a couple of minutes goes by, whatever was happening, lets him log in and back in business. Good to go. So it could be that, too. I, I've seen it. I, I've seen both of these things, to be honest. So, yeah. But if it's happening, could- if it's happening on the home screen or the lock screen, uh, it, it is definitely iOS asking you for this, not some third party app. I mean, the other thing you could do is go to the, um, what screen is it here? Hold on. So, I mean, yeah, on iOS, if you go to settings, I think it's settings. Is it settings and then mail or passwords and accounts? Yep. That so would make sense. This yep. prompt, so if you do get this prompt, um, you may want to go to passwords and accounts under settings and manually. And from that screen, because you know that's a legit screen. Enter, re-enter the password there. I'll buy that. Yeah, yeah. And I've done that sometimes. Yeah, sometimes some cache gets corrupted or, or the server gets cranky, and uh, uh, I would enter it from there rather than just kind of a suspect. Uh, yeah, you know, if you yeah, that's better nowhere. That's fair. If it, yeah, if if you're suspect of the dialogue, just go go enter it here. Yeah, yeah. Cool. All right. Uh, Another iOS mystery. Sandy writes in with, uh, she says, I I think it's she. I don't know, actually. Oh, no, it definitely is. Yeah. Uh, My contacts sync between my iPhone XS and my iPad 4, but will not sync with iCloud and my 2017 iMac running Mojave. I've looked uh, in the discussions, but I've found no answer online. I haven't checked relevant knowledge base articles or I have checked, sorry, relevant knowledge base articles and followed instructions to no avail. I have no idea why iCloud won't sync my iPhone or iPad contacts with itself and or my iMac. I have closed the contacts on all devices and unchecked and rechecked the contacts box in preferences on Mac and the iPhone. I'm assuming that's iCloud preferences. Uh, That didn't work. I have refreshed all the contacts on the iPhone. I couldn't found, find out how to do it on iCloud or on the, on the iMac. That also didn't work. And uh, then she says, if I change contact in iCloud, then the contacts on the iMac get changed. And so will the iPhone and iPad. However, now I have two copies of the item and the iPhone on the iPhone and iPad, but only one on iCloud and the iMac. If I delete the copy iCloud put on the phone, then it is deleted on all devices. I can't seem to put a change on the iPhone and have it go to all places. So this gets really interesting because what uh, there's a couple of ways this can go. We'll talk about the way that it has gone with Sandy, but um, but it can go other directions uh, as well. With Sandy, she has now wound up with if you go a great place to sort of get a feel for what what might be happening is launch contacts on your iPhone or your iPad. And in the upper left, kind of go back out to the main view, and then the upper left will change to, say, groups. Tap on that. You will see separate groups for each account that is configured to have contacts on your phone. And this can really kind of give you a bird's eye view of what's going on here. Uh, The first thing it could show you is that you might have multiple accounts configured for contacts. In addition to iCloud, you might have a Gmail account for contacts. You might have an exchange account. You might have multiple Gmail accounts. And any of these scenarios could cause duplicate contacts to appear. So definitely worth checking that. Now, in Sandy's case, she looked and saw that she had only one account configured, an iCloud account, and all the groups in there were duplicated. So if she had a group name family, it said family twice. If she had a group name work, it said work twice. 
So this explains why she was saying duplicate contacts on there. But based on all the other symptoms, it sounds like only one of those was syncing with iCloud. So my thoughts on this, John, are as follows. I would at the very first, I would go to the iMac uh, because she says that things are working well there and it's a Mac, which is a good combination because you can go into contacts on the on the Mac and go to the file menu and choose export contacts archive. That, my friends, is a very easy to use backup for your contacts. Certainly Time Machine keeps a backup of these things. And there's, you know, if you if you were to backup, you drive other ways, it keeps a backup. But exporting that contacts archive gives you a very portable, importable backup that can be used to recover if any of the next steps screw you up. So bear that part in mind. It really makes life way easier than relying on other backups. So go shoot one of those manually, save it to your desktop or wherever you like. Now that you know things are safe, what I would do is I would log completely out of iCloud on the phone and restart the phone and then log back into iCloud on the phone and see if that then only slurps down one of each thing inside iCloud. It seems like the phone got kind of out of sync and then back in sync with iCloud, but kept its duplicate groups, which happens. Really, it's that a cache on the phone needs to be cleaned. But since we can't clean caches on the iPhone, we kind of have to take a sledgehammer to it instead of a scalpel. And that's sign out and sign back in. So what do you think, Mr. Braun? I was looking at my contacts and I saw some duplicates. Okay. And the thing is, in contacts on the Mac, there is something you may want to do every now and then. So what you can do is you can highlight. Um, so there's an all contacts group. Okay. What you may want to do is go to all contacts, uh, select all of them. And then if you go to the card menu within contacts, there's a couple of handy dandy choices here which you may want to run every now and then and i haven't for a while and maybe i should sure but there's something it says look for duplicates for example i'm gonna run it right now and it's like oh uh 22 duplicate cards and 17 duplicated entries were found duplicate cards that have the same name but contain different information uh, so on and so forth do you want to merge them um so that may help clean up your act well, it wouldn't right. help Sandy, right? Because her Mac isn't showing any of these problems, right? Her problems are on both of her iOS devices. But that is ah, good. Okay. That is good okay. advice for someone who's having duplicate contact issues. Related. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And there's another one also. And there's another selection there. It says merge and link selected cards. So um, that can be the handy one when you've got a Google contact record and an iCloud contact record for the same person. Uh, where you can, if you merge them together, then contacts will sync them separately, but, but treat them as the same. And that's pretty good. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Um, Kiwi Graham in our chat room at MacGeekab.com slash stream says, uh, any chance that she has the same iCloud account logged in twice on her iPhone? And I think that is entirely possible. I think you can, I know you can have a second iCloud account. And I think that second iCloud account can sync contacts. I, I'm nine. In fact, I'm 99% certain of that. Yeah. So yeah, that's also possible. But I think if that were the case, it would show up as a second iCloud account account when you launch the contacts app and go to groups and that she was not seeing that. Usually those groups are organized by account, which is why I didn't think she had a second account, but it, it's possible. Certainly. So, and, uh, Kiwi says, be careful with merge. And I will reiterate, you know, rewind and listen to how to back up contacts. Uh, he says, I had one client who merged all his contacts into a single card. That sounds like a mess. That's a pretty big contract record, man. <laughs> I wonder which name it picked. Wow. Not good. Not good. Any more thoughts on this one, John? We're good. Cool. And yeah, Dave Ginsburg confirms uh, in the chat room again, I'm signed in with two accounts and use contacts on both of them. So thank you, Dave, for confirming that much appreciated. 
Chuck has a question. Um, Chuck says, uh, if I decide to hold on to High Sierra on my Mac, is there a way to turn off the daily reminders that an upgrade to Mojave is available? That pop-up pop up is a minor issue to deal with, but a daily annoyance to close. So the answer I have for you is probably it doesn't work for everyone. But if you open the Mac App Store app on your Mac, go into the Updates tab from the list of uh, App Store page options, and in the banner for macOS Mojave, control click anywhere inside that banner and select hide update. According to others, bingo, no more notification. So there, uh, that that's, have you, well, you've up, updated to Mojave everywhere. So um, if anybody has tried that and it hasn't worked, um, but you found another solution, let us know. As I said in the intro, our email address is feedback at macgeekab.com. Did I hear you right, Dave? Did you say feedback at MacGeekab.com? That is what I said. Unless you're a premium subscriber, in which case premium at MacGeekab.com is where you can go with these things. So very good stuff. Hey, I want to take a minute and thank our first sponsor, John, which is Ops Genie from Atlassian. You know, incidents happen, my friend, and <laughs> they're inevitable, right? I mean, it's why we do this show, because incidents happen. Really, what it comes down to is how you deal with them. And if an incident happens at work, it comes down to how your company responds, right? you got to be able to coordinate everything between operations teams and software development teams. All the unsung heroes that are putting out fires every day, they need to be alerted properly and they need to be kept in sync. Getting those alerts immediately to the right people is critical when an incident occurs. And that's why Ops Genie from Atlassian is what you need because ops genie empowers your dev and ops teams to plan for any disruptions and stay in control it's the coolest thing right we've used it here too it knows because you tell it what your uh you know your fallback tree is right so who's the first person that should be contacted if that person can't be reached or isn't available you know who's the next person who's the next person so if one person's sleeping because that person dave is on eastern time but another person is likely to be awake because that other person adam is on pacific time then guess what happens ops genie knows to fall back if it's like you know 2 a.m eastern but 11 p.m pacific it's like oh yeah these guys are night owls but dave might not be awake so also alert adam make sure he knows ops genie does this it helps you respond quickly to unplanned issues because it notifies the right people at the right time it understands time zones and holidays and all that stuff and because it's linked with everything now because it's part of atlassian you get all these integrations of course you get the atlassian ones like jira right but also amazon cloudwatch datadog new relic all kinds of great stuff and ops genie tracks all your activity and provides useful insights to, to improve future responses to future incidents so you got to check it out visit opsgenie.com to sign up and get a free company account you can add up to five team members to this free account. No credit card, no nothing. Go now. Ops Genie, O P S G E N I E dot com. Never miss a critical alert again with Ops Genie because with Ops Genie, your next incident doesn't stand a chance. Our second sponsor is BB Edit from Barebones. You might have seen recently. BB Edit now, and Barebones in general now has a merch store open again so you can go there and check that out and you can even buy fun stuff and you can get a t-shirt that people will have to think about to understand because it's pictures and a pictogram kind of thing which i really like i've been wearing my t-shirt quite a bit since i got it and i like it i'm talking about the rebus black tea and you gotta go i'm not gonna tell you what it is you gotta go to barebones.com and look at it to figure out what the t-shirt is telling you and then once you realize what it's telling you you're gonna want to have one too so check it out at barebones.com and while you're at barebones.com ordering your t-shirt download a free copy of bb edit if you're not yet using bb edit go get it it, you got a full 30-day free trial on this, but after 30 days, 
the core features remain free. Free. You can just keep using them. So you can do things like word counts, comparing documents. Uh, even most of the programming languages that it understands are still available in the free version. HTML stuff. You can FTP files back and forth. You've got to check this out. So go to barebones.com. Figure out what the heck Dave is talking about with the Rebus t-shirt, right? You want to check that out. And then download your free copy of BB Edit while you're there. Barebones.com. Our thanks to Barebones for sponsoring this episode. Yeah, what, what, what was the occasion for this uh, merch store, Dave? 25th anniversary of BB Edit, man. <laughs> it's pretty crazy, right? It's pretty crazy. Yep. Yeah, it's good stuff. Yeah, man. Cool. Ah, all right. Shall we go to Andrew here, John? Might as well. Okay. Might as well. All right. Andrew takes us into Routerland, a place that we know and, and love. Well, we at the very least, we love it. He says, I just purchased a Netgear Nighthawk AC2400 router to replace a much older one. I have a potpourri of devices in the house going back to an iPad 2 and would like to be able to serve Wi-Fi to all of them, of course. He says we have Cablevision's 200 megabit per second service. We also have a Netgear N300 Wi-Fi range extender that's working well for another floor of the home, which we may slash are hoping to be able to retire. But I can test that once I get your feedback. The only other question is what security option to choose when setting it up so that the devices are relatively easy to set up when entering Wi-Fi passwords. Uh, and with all that said, is it a good idea to keep this Nighthawk AC2400, it's still in the box. Or would you recommend I look elsewhere if my budget is in the $100 to $150 range? Okay, so that AC2400, and we'll put a link to this in the show notes, is actually a pretty good router, especially for the price. It is a dual band 4x4 router, meaning there are four radios or four antennas, and which means four streams, per radio so you got a 2.4 gigahertz radio with four streams and a five gigahertz radio with four streams the more streams in theory allows more bandwidth that's not actually how it works because most of your devices don't support more than two streams at a time but what those four streams means on your router is that it can tune and pick the best ones the best antennas to get to your device and you do wind up in my experience with four by four routers where you get a much uh, faster connection and therefore much longer range than you do with a two by two or a three by three. So this is a pretty good one. The really the other four by four router uh, that I recommend is the Synology, but that's a little bit more. It's about 75 bucks more than this one. This one I think is about 125 and uh, the Synology is 199. So if you don't need the v inbound VPN and, uh, cloud station and intrusion protection and all that stuff that the Synology offers, then um, then the the AC twenty four hundred from Netgear is a is a great router. I I highly recommend it in the scenario where you know mesh doesn't apply and it sounds like perhaps in Andrew's house mesh doesn't apply, but it might, especially if he was previously using a range extender. I I'm not sure I would recommend keeping that particular range extender that N three hundred will seem mighty slow compared to your new router. So, uh, so there you go. Yes. Um, and as far as security, I would do WPA two. Uh, I would not. Oh, uh, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, you know, like the, the new Synology firmware has WPA three available in it and it's got a, a mixed mode where you can do two and three. I, I, honestly, my experience with that is don't, not yet. Not until you have devices that support WPA3. I, there was a, some wonkiness in the, the mixed mode implementation with some devices. Yeah. So, yeah just oh, I, haven't, I haven't even heard of that. Hmm. WPA3. Well, WPA2 has basically been proven to be not all that safe anymore, right? I mean, it, there's, 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 a I think, a pretty major security hole in it, if I'm not mistaken, right? So, uh, so we need to move on. But, uh, you know. There you go. I think in general, the, the things you want to look at is, so you're going to see a lot of products that have AC something, some number in them. Yeah. The higher the number, the faster your, the faster the potential, the, <laughs> the faster you can possibly go. 
And then the other thing, as, as you pointed out, is the number of antennas typically indicates the number of radios and the more antennas, um, the better. Yeah. So, And generally your speed numbers are a factor of the, the antennas, right? Because on, on 2.4, they count each antenna as being worth 150 megabits. So on this router, that would be uh, 600, right? Because, you know, 600 times four on the 2.4 gigahertz is, uh, or sorry, four times one, sorry. <sighs> on 2.4 gigahertz, each antenna is worth 150 megabits per second. So four of them gets you 600. That's a much easier way to say it. And also accurate. On five gigahertz, <laughs> it uh, is 433 per antenna, right? So 433 times four is 1733, 1733 plus 600 is 2300, 2333 comes out to 2400. Sometimes it gets rounded up and, uh, and you'll see routers showing, you know, um, the 2600 for these, uh, it, it's not actually correct. None of these numbers are correct, but that's how they get these numbers. So there you go. Yeah, do good. the math. Do, do the, the math. math. Math is fun. Math is good. All right, John. Uh, shall we go on to James, my friend, or should we stay with Andrew? Was there more with Andrew here? No, no, no. I think we're good. Okay, and, and you're right. Math is fun. Well, you know, music is fun too. Actually, that's how I got into. Uh, for people that don't know, I play the sax. And, and one of the things that I liked about music is that music is really kind of about math, or at least that's the way I saw it. <laughs> it's a lot. Yeah. I, I often joke on, on another podcast that I do called gig gab for working musicians at gig gab podcast.com to throw it out there for anybody that uh, would like to listen uh, is that some of these theater gigs that I do, the ones that I've actually shying away from doing in the future because they're not as much fun are, uh, you know, when I'm not on stage and not able to see the actors, I, I refer to those as Dave solving math problems on the drums in a closet. And uh, and it's true, right? Because, you know, everything works. Not only is there math in the way uh, rhythms are played, right? But there's also math in the uh, in the harmonics of the notes, right? And the things that make the music sound the way it sounds. It's all harmonics and uh, harmonics can be scales explained with math. Yeah. 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 I mean, that's what I liked about it. You know, whole notes, half notes, quarter notes, eighth notes, triplets. It's, mm -hmm. uh, it's fractions. It's all fractions. Yeah. It is all fractions. Yeah. I had a fun conversation with, um, with my friend Ivan Drucker at Mac Tech. Ivan's a fantastic consultant in, in Manhattan, who, by the way, has one of the best Apple II collections I've ever seen in my life. I had so much fun hanging out in his in his office a couple of weeks ago. But um, we had a really fun conversation about metric modulation, where you make things sound different, uh, rhythms sound different just by changing the way you write them and make it sound like you're in four time when you're in six time or the opposite. Yeah, it's very interesting fun stuff but yeah there you go should we go on to james sure okay that's an interesting detour didn't expect that today james writes uh as with many in your audience i'm sure the mac mini as a home server is tempting i could use it for plex i could use it as an additional backup location an ssh endpoint runner of garbage software clients i always need running but don't want to see i.e scan snap software and more but could I get many of these benefits from my existing iMac by using a hidden user that's always logged in in the background? What benefits of a separate Mac mini server would I be giving up by using the iMac for many of these tasks? So as soon as I saw this question, I knew we needed to talk about this in the show because it's it, not only is it a great question, but I think it's going to be fun to, to dive in here. So um, I, I'll, I'll kind of start with the basics, right, John? If the iMac can be on all the time, then that's one concern avoided, right? If for whatever reason you feel like the iMac needs to be turned off or slept or whatever, then you don't want it running as your server. But if you were going to do that with your Mac mini anyway, fine. Um, and then there's the resources, right? The big three are RAM, CPU, and disk. So RAM is an easy one to suss out in that you want to make sure you've got enough RAM to have a second user logged in and running all those background processes, whatever they are, without impacting your day-to-day -day stuff. And, you know, macOS isn't fantastic at managing memory. 
Like it's okay, but if you're interacting with the computer, you probably are going to want to reboot it once a week or so uh, just to get it to kind of clean stuff up. I, I seem to find on all my Macs that when they get wonky, my uptime is in the double digits in terms of the number of days. So just bear that in mind and make sure you have enough RAM. You know, 16 at a minimum for the scenario you're sort of describing, 32 might be better. But RAM's relatively cheap, so that probably check the box. Uh, CPU, same thing. Pretty obvious. You just want to make sure whatever processes you're running on this, you know, server user or however you're doing it, aren't chewing up so much CPU that you uh, aren't left with enough to, you know, to functionally use the machine the way you want. And then the weird one is disk access. This one's not necessarily as easy to suss out, but you want to make sure that you are not running something that impedes upon your access to the disk. Because if two things are trying to get to the disk simultaneously all the time, it, your computer will feel much slower than it actually is. For example, you wouldn't want to have, you wouldn't want to be running a, a time machine backup server where you've got four Macs backing up time machine to, to your computer and having it save those backups on the boot drive of that Mac while you're also trying to use that Mac, right? This would just slow you down immensely, but you could hang an external drive off of it and have them save there. And as long as you've got, you know, again, enough CPU and Ram, then that disk is not in the way of the, you know, the main disk on it. So, so I would, I would definitely consider, you know, that as part of it. If, if you're running, you know, fairly low disk usage server apps, fine. But even your media library server, like Plex is going to want to index the library pretty routinely and stuff. You might just want to compartmentalize that off on a separate, separate drive. And eh, maybe you're good to go. What do you think, John? Those are, that's my initial thoughts here. Um, one thing that I think, Dave, is uh, I just saw in my uh, Twitter stream, somebody was uh, shaking their fist uh, at Apple's latest uh, offering saying, I don't know if I'm really happy with the performance of the latest uh, Mac Mini for, uh, for what they charge. Okay. I'm like, hmm, well, how do you, and I think the question is being brought up here as well is, how do you know how much horsepower the various machines have? You know what I'm saying? Yes. And I'll tell you, I, I just stumbled across this and uh, I, I haven't looked at it for a while, but, okay. uh, but I think it's a, it's a, it's a good reference point to uh, determine the, the relative oomph of each machine. Sure. So we got our friend Mac tracker. And if you run Mac tracker, I, I don't know if I've ever saw this before, but so if you run Mac Tracker and you you double click on a machine here, like the Mac Mini, in the General tab, it'll show you a bunch of statistics about the machine, the processor, the RAM, the price, but then it also has processor speed listed. And if you click on that link, so it's a it's a it's a link, and if you click on it, Dave, it shows you the benchmark scores for that particular machine for each um for each uh, clock speed which uh, i i don't think i've ever seen that before so really? that, that can help look at yeah, that oh yeah 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 so it shows single core multi-core and the various clock speeds for for that particular offering so that's nice uh, that so it's using geekbench 4 sure which uh you know is a general purpose uh benchmarking thing but that that's another thing you may want to look at to help you make a decision about, you know, what, what machine would be more appropriate for doing this sort of thing. Huh? That's interesting. Yeah. Why is my Mac tracker not updated? This is weird. I don't have the 2018 uh, air or Mac mini really? in my Mac tracker. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I got, I got a 2018. They just pushed out an update. Maybe you did. Maybe. Uh, I, yeah. Maybe I haven't grabbed it yet. In your okay. app store. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, that's actually, that's fantastic. I like that. That's, and it also shows the model number of the CPU, which can be a really handy thing, as I recently found out, John. Uh, but but I'll come back to that. I'll I'll circle back to that. So any any other thoughts on the the running a a dedicated Mac for server tasks versus uh but you know just doing it as a background user? Uh. 
I've never done that background user thing. So no, no, not really. Yeah. I mean, but think about like, it's, I, I hadn't thought about it either, but it actually makes a lot of sense. I mean, that way you can compartmentalize stuff off and, you know, you're not stuck with these windows kind of open and in the way while you're, while you're doing whatever it is you need to do with your Mac. But, um, but you know, why dedicate an extra machine? I mean, this, right. I, it for for the things he describes i think this might be a good solution you know the only one i would worry about is plex and it depends on if you're doing transcoding if you're letting your mac do transcoding for movies that are going to then play on you know on your tv now it might be a scenario where you're if you're running plex on your apple tv you're not sitting at your computer so that's actually a great simultaneous or not simultaneous, but shared use of that resource. But it's possible that a Plex transcode, especially for one that it's trying to do on the fly, might use more CPU than you would like to give up, um, you know, during your daytime hours. And also bear in mind that if you say, you know, I know when I'm planning a trip or something, if, if I'm going to if I were going to leave tomorrow for a trip. At some point today, I would have grabbed my iPad and gone into the Plex app and said, okay, yeah, I want to download these four movies or whatever. And I would tell it, yeah, shrink them down to medium. I don't need like the full res of the movie. I'm just going to watch it on my iPad. And I've learned for me that on an airplane, medium is it, Plex's medium is fine. So I tell it medium. What it does is it tells the Plex server that I run here to crunch the movie down, shrink it a little bit, and then send it off to my iPad. Well, that crunching and shrinking uses a lot of CPU and it does it during the day in my scenario. So just bear those things in mind. That would be in terms of CPU, that would be the big one that I think. So um, I don't know. I kind of like this idea, John. It's pretty cool. I mean, my other thought, if you have the coin, is that when I hear media server and at least in, in my setup here, Dave, my media server is my Synology. And right. I got my tunes and I got my movies um, on the Synology. Well, yeah, but that's a separate box. I mean, that's what he's saying. Yeah, no, you know, know. yeah, 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 yeah. So, yeah, I, it's an interesting idea. I, I am, I am not, I, 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 I kind of like it. I kind of like it, especially, you know, there's no harm in trying it this way too, right? Because worst case scenario, you decide, oh crap, you know, this isn't working. I need to use my, I, I need to get a Mac mini for this. Well, guess what? You can migration assistant just that one user over to your new Mac mini and you save a bunch of configuration time. But the flip side of that is if you do set it up on your iMac and it works, you just saved yourself a bunch of money. So kind of like this idea. It's good. It's good. Uh, while we're on the subject, John, I, uh, you know, I, I recently ordered a, a couple of MacBook Airs, 2018 MacBook Airs, one for me and one for Lucas. Now, th for Lucas, it is most definitely a Christmas present. He knows what he's getting. What he doesn't know is what color, because we decided to get two different colors so that we could easily tell them apart around the house. So I'm not going to say in the show here what the color is. I'm also hoping Lu Lucas doesn't listen to this show, to this particular episode, which he probably won't. But... Um, because he, too, is going to be excited about something that I noticed in setting mine up. Um, I was going to wait until Christmas to set mine up, too, and then realize, no, that's stupid. Because if this thing's too slow for me or I don't like it for some reason, I want to know that while I'm still in the return window in an easy to deal with way. Right. Uh, the, the shortcut to the end, I'm keeping it. I like this thing. My biggest concern about this, and I talked about this when we uh, discussed all the new Macs is that it's an i5 chip in the new MacBook Airs, right, John? And i5 is the chip that sometimes, with an asterisk, doesn't have hyper-threading. It's a dual-core chip. And so I was thinking, man, you know, I'm going from the, 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 the worst I have right now is a dual-core chip with hyper-threading, and I'm going to a dual-core chip without it. How am I going to feel about this? So... I fired up the new air. I migrated all my stuff over for whatever reason. Migration assistant failed the first time from my existing air. 
So I cloned my air to, I, I keep a clone of my air. So I just migrated from the clone the second time and it went great. I, it, uh, side note, John, I think it's possible that the, the drive in my old air is beginning to fail. So timing is everything. But, uh, you know, iStat menus came up and I see four entries in the CPU dialog or CPU thing in the menu. And I'm like, wow, oh, that's wrong. Like this is an i5. It doesn't have hyper threading. So maybe it's just inherited that from the other one. I look and I'm like, no, like the way things are showing up up there, it's definitely seeing four distinct entries. And so I dug now, had I had the latest version of Mac tracker, which solved my problem here, John, I would have seen that we have since I did, I did some research because when we first talked about this, we didn't know what processor it was. Well, now we do. And it is uh, Intel core I five. Uh, it's an Amber Lake chip, which is the current uh, 2018 build of, of Intel's processors. And it is an 8210Y chip. Now, the interesting thing about the Core i5s, I believe since last year's model, the KB Lakes, so the 2017s and later, is that the dual core i5s are hyper-threaded. So you get four threads on any of the dual core i5s. The quad core i5s, no. Those just have four threads. That's it. Um, quad core i7s have eight threads. The six core i5s, just six threads. But the two core i5s, four threads, which means you get the hyper threading. It's almost, it's kind of, for some operations, it's like having extra two extra cores. Not all, but some. So I was very excited about that. And that sort of explained why this machine felt as fast as it did. And with 16 gigs of RAM, man, am I glad that I got the 16 in these. Um, even just kind of messing around on it yesterday, I did some of our show prep with it, John. And um, already I was in active RAM of, you know, 12 gigs or something. So it's like, yep, I did the right thing. So. So. Which I thought was pretty cool. Um, and of course the MacBook Pro, which is, has last year's processor, the dual core i5 is also hyper threaded. So very similar CPUs between the dual core i5 and the MacBook Pro and the dual core i5 and the MacBook Air. I'll put a link in the show notes that compares them on Intel's site, but, um, it, they are not much different at all. The base frequency of the MacBook Pro is a little higher, but the turbo frequency of them both is 3.6. So it's the same. Um, same amount of cache, the, um, I'm trying to think what the only difference is the memory bandwidth is a little faster. You can, oh, and the MacBook pro can handle 32 gigs of Ram, which the MacBook air can only do 16. Um, but everything else is pretty much the same. There was like one thing that it, that it had a yes to the others. No. Oh, Intel V pro platform eligibility. The MacBook airs chip says no on that. So other than that, pretty much the same, but you can take a look for yourself. So there you go. Thoughts on this, John, anything? Yeah, I think, I don't know. I think Intel is making it, <clears throat> it's kind of confusing to tell yeah. you the truth. Yes, I agree. Well, no, first you got the i3, the i5, the i7, and then you have, you know, the hyper threading and the turbo boost. And then, you know, but you, as you pointed out, I mean, they have a comparison chart, but it's like, I don't know if I really want that many choices, <laughs> you know? Yeah. 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 I, uh, yes, I, it's confusing. I mean, it's nice that you can have these two different processors that can do slightly different things and use different amounts of power to do these different things. Right. Y you know, so I, uh, uh, but it, it is confusing for sure. Uh, you know, and it's tough to suss out like, you know, cause I was trying to decide between the 13 inch MacBook air and the 13 inch MacBook pro. I don't run my, my machines at full brightness. So the additional brightness of the MacBook pro didn't matter to me. It's got the same two Thunderbolt three ports, right? You know, that none of that's different. And the air has the touch ID sensor, which I'm finding to be very handy. Um, it's going to be tough to put, put the thing, put this thing back in the box for two weeks tomorrow. And so I can open it under the tree with Lucas, but, um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. So fun stuff, but I'm, I'm pretty stoked about this air. So I figured I'd, I'd share that here. 
Anything more on this, John, before we move on? No, I'm a... I don't know if and when, probably when they die, <laughs> I'll get a new machine. But right now, what I got, uh, what I got, I'm pretty happy with. Uh, your MacBook Pro is a quad core machine. Is that right? Uh, let's look here. I do believe it's an i7. Let's look here. Okay. Well, yeah. I so I got four, I got four bars in, uh, the, yeah. So it's a 2.3 gigahertz Intel core i7. But that still could be with four bars in activity or in, uh, well, in activity monitor or iStep menus. That's likely, possibly just a dual core machine with hyper threading. It depends on how how you have it set. I'm pretty sure this one is quad. All right. Well, let's use Mac Tracker to check which uh, which model is it. It's a MacBook Pro. What year? Uh, Mid 2012. Okay, so we are going down to MacBook Pro Retina 13 inch. No, it's four. It's four cores. I'm looking okay. in the. Uh, so I looked in the system report. Okay. So it's MacBook Pro nine comma one Intel Core i seven, and it says number of processors one. Yes. Number of cores four. Great. So okay, there you go. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. And the Mac Mini, I think, is a i five, and that only has two cores. Ooh, oh, and I wonder if that one's hyper. But it does have not. a hyper threading because the thing yeah, is, okay. iStep menus does give me a choice to show either two or four bars, and I decided to have it just show two, just so it had some parity with the way I have it set up on mm-hmm. the other machine. Sure. Yeah, I, th- I thought it was kind of misleading showing four when it's like, well, no, it really has two. It's actually bars, really handy to see. I mean, handy. It, it's it feeds my curiosity well, because it's interesting to it's interesting. see when it's engaged. Yes. Yeah, cuz right. not everything engages those those hyper threaded uh those hyper threads. Uh it's interesting watching that happen, but like handbrake will, handbrake will max them all out. It's pretty cool. Yeah. So Oh yeah, when I when I rip things on the Yeah. yeah I typically rip them on the uh on the uh on the MacBook and yeah, it it saturates the all, all the bars are at maximum. Right. Right. It takes full advantage of uh of the all the cores. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Cool. Uh I have some more things to say from you folks to share actually about our um our our new machines and things like that. But I wanted to take a minute and talk about our next two sponsors if that works for you, my friend Mr. Braun. Yeah? Absolutely. Cool. Our next sponsor is Eero. Uh, we're at Eero.com slash MGG. You can use coupon code MGG to get a hundred bucks off the Eero base unit and the two beacons package and one year of Eero plus. So this is a cool thing. We've talked about Eero many times on the show, both as part of sponsor spots and of course, just as part of our regular content because so many of us use it. And really they were the first to, to make consumer Wi-Fi mesh a, a usable thing and a, a, a functional thing. And it's more than that. They've made it an enjoyable thing. And that's fantastic. Uh, you know, you can get kits in different ways. As I mentioned, you know, the deal we have is you get the, the Eero base unit plus two beacons, the beacons just plug directly into outlets. So they're kind of out of the way and right where you'd want them, which is not in the way and yet still getting Wi-Fi all over the house makes life easy, but you can get all kinds of different configurations based on what you need. And then you have, you know, mesh Wi-Fi throughout your home, which is awesome. It just blankets your home and Wi-Fi coverage. You don't have to worry about dead spots and all of that. Eero Plus, which you get a free year of at Eero.com slash MGG. That's E-E-R-O dot com slash MGG. Coupon code MGG at checkout. Eero Plus adds a whole new layer of stuff. Offers total network protection, which blocks malicious and unwanted content across your entire network. John and I have both seen this in our setups with Eero. Uh, It's got advanced security, so it checks the sites you visit against a database of millions of known threats and prevents you from accidentally visiting any of those malicious sites. It offers different content blocking for things that you might want to block, violent content, illegal content, adult content. So you can choose what your kids and anybody in your house has access to. John really... Um, when I'm at his house, man, I'm locked down. I can't access anything but like the the most pure stuff. And that's just how it should be at Casa Braun. Uh, and then you get VPN protection from Encrypt.me. You get uh, a 
one password subscription as part of this. You get a malware byte subscription as part of this. That's part of Eero Plus. You just get that. And again, if you go to Eero, E-E-R-O dot com slash MGG with coupon code MGG at checkout, you get that Eero Plus one year part of the deal, Eero base unit and two beacons package, and you get a hundred bucks off the whole deal. So you got to check it out. Go to, again, one last time, Eero.com slash MGG. Use coupon code MGG at checkout. Um, and our thanks to Eero for sponsoring this episode. Our next sponsor is Jamf Now. We're at jamf.com slash MGG. You, yes, you get an account that allows you to use up to three devices. It's a free account and you can have up to three devices on there for free and more than three costs you uh, starts at just two bucks a month per device. And it's pretty awesome because the way Jamf works is it allows you to keep track of any Mac or iOS devices that you have to manage and you get to keep track of them remotely. So be it for your business, maybe you've got uh, staff or employees that you have to manage. Maybe you're a consultant and you need to manage all kinds of iOS and Mac devices for people that maybe aren't quite as tech savvy as you are. This can make your life way easier because it lets you do things like distributing Wi-Fi and email settings, deploying apps, enforcing passcodes, protecting data. You can even remote lock or wipe a device if you need to. And you can do this from anywhere. Jamf now helps you manage your devices so you can focus on what you need to do for your business and your life. No IT experience needed. And like I said, Mac Geek Gab listeners get a special deal. You can manage, you get a free account, again, no credit card required, and you get your first three, or up to three devices, it doesn't just have to be your first three. If you take, if you have three, you take one off, you can put another one on, and it's still free. After those three devices, if you have more than three devices on the account at any one time, prices start at just two bucks a month per device. Go create your free account today. J-A-M-F dot com slash M-G-G, that's Jamf dot com slash M-G-G. Our thanks to Jamf for sponsoring this episode. All right, John, uh, let's go to Steve here because Steve has a question on new computers that I think is relevant to our topics of discussion today. And Steve writes somewhere. Steve writes, there it is. <laughs> Do you have a recommendation for a monitor for my late 2013 Mac pro that would be close to the quality of the new 4k and 5k iMac displays. We recently upgraded my wife's eight year old iMac. And now my 24 inch led Apple cinnamon display is not looking so good. And he says, my other thought is to upgrade my Mac pro to an iMac pro or 27 inch iMac. Do you think I would take much of a hit in performance, say for handbrake encoding going from a six core Mac pro down to a four core 27 inch iMac. The iMac pro is much more the machine than I need, but so is the Mac pro when I bought it. That's the way I roll. Okay. So let's start with the second half of this, since that sort of flows from our previous conversation here. Um, this is the four core 27 inch iMac. If it's the I five, then as we just discussed, this is not a hyper threaded thing. So you get four threads on the four core I five on this 27 inch iMac. Uh, is that going to be a big hit? It's going to be a hit from coming from a six core Mac pro with hyper threading down to a four core. So you're, you're going from 12 to four. Yes. It's a, you know, what five year newer CPU. Um, you know, uh, so I, like, yeah, it, what is it? A, uh, last it's last year's four core. So, it, I mean, if you, if you go to a four core I seven, on the iMac, which I think, can you do that? I mean, can you do a four core i5 or are they only i7? See, this is why it's good that we have Mac Tracker launched here, John. Let's take a look at this here. So the iMac is, where are we here? There we are. It is a four core. Oh, it's only an i, oh no, 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 no. It's either an i5 or an i7. So if you get the i7, then I think that would probably be faster than your old Mac Pro, to be perfectly honest. Um, in terms of CPU, given, given everything all else being equal, but we could check that out, right, John? Cause you can look at the processor speeds and the benchmarks and the benchmarks. Yeah. Yeah. 
So on multi-core, the 3.8 gigahertz chip is, uh, where are we here? Maximum. Oh, that's maximums. Okay. 3.8 is a 15,000. Let's look at the Mac Pro. Maybe I'll prove myself wrong here. Uh, yes. Oh, yeah, the Mac Pro, actually on multi-core, gets up to 20,000 on that on that model. So, yeah, there you go. You'll take a 25% hit if you do that one. So, there you go. Mac, <laughs> Mac tracker for the, uh, for the win there, John. I like it. Answers the question. Is it gonna is it gonna really matter? Maybe depends on how quickly you need your handbrake conversions to, to finish. What do you think, John? Yeah, I mean, yeah. When I do my ripping, I'll start it and then you know go out and do my chores. And when I get back home, it's uh, it's all set, it's done. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. I mean, sometimes it, you know, for most discs, well, at least the uh, standard DVDs. Um, which uh, don't tell my library, but sometimes when I get new titles that are on DVD, I may rip them because oh. I didn't watch them. And then once you watch them, you delete them, of course, right? Oh, of course, yeah. Okay. So, so I think it's just, it's just extending my rental period. Mm. Interesting. But, Interesting. Um, DVDs usually take eh, sometimes an hour. Yeah. Blu-rays. Yeah. I'm trying to think. I because I, I've also rip blu-rays um well i got a blu-ray external blu-ray drive because yep. of course apple i don't think is ever going to offer blu-ray right no they aren't gonna they aren't offering anything anymore right so yeah yeah as far as uh cd or dvd or blue yeah right optical disc drives hmm. really nothing no i don't think so not anymore no no, no you're right you're right no. No. But yeah of course you know it's a lot more data i mean it's prettier right <laughs> right uh yeah you yeah blu-rays really take something go ahead well no i'm testing something out right now no uh, i'm on the fence about it it was a uh, something that i don't know if you saw it in your mailbox but it's um somebody who um offers a hdmi cable that allegedly upscales your content and uh really I'm trying to figure out I'm, I'm I'm trying to do a comparison between my old between regular my regular HDMI cable and and one of these and just um so I'll get right. back to you on that. Well, but there are people that offer products that uh, claim to upscale your content and make it look HD ish or 4K ish, and that that's uh, one of the things this this does. Huh? Uh, well, yeah, know, my check, TV check, TV check, TVs will do TV that too. Box. Yeah. Well, check your TMO box because it was just a random mailing, and they're like, "Hey, you know, we got press samples of this thing. You want one?" And I'm like, "Yeah, sure." You know, huh. interesting. Always yeah. nice to get, you know, higher resolution content, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's weird. I mean, I, I guess weird. TVs do that too, right? Where they'll they'll do the upsampling and all that stuff, so you can have it, you know, display at 1080p, even if you've got 720p content or you know whatever. So. And I've seen at some shows I've gone to that they they offer players that also up to yeah. jobs. Yeah, is yeah. this is I mean, this it's... well? You, you know what? Test this thing out. I, I have all kinds of questions, but they're irrelevant if they don't if it doesn't actually look any better. So test it out. Let us know if it's if it's worthwhile or not, and then I, and then I have all kinds of questions. Yeah, the the uh, I'll have to do a yeah. side by side comparison. But um, the the one thing I did notice is that it does. Um, certain shows that I watch, um, things will get pixelated because the action is very quick. Cause I think I only have a 60, 60 Hertz, I guess, um, TV. And I did notice that it, that it did make that better huh. is that things were less pixelated. So, so it's doing That's something. The point. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, circling we'll back see that to see that at CES. Definitely. Okay. <laughs> I'm sure you'll see yeah, a lot of that. I'm sure. I'm sure you're right. Yeah. Uh, as far as monitors for Steve's first question, uh, I totally understand having a non quote unquote retina display alongside or even in the same uh, realm as a retina display. It makes a big difference. Uh, the, the, the rest of the world doesn't call it retina. They call it UHD, right? And, and so what you're looking for is a third party UHD display. And, 
I've got one that I love that I use uh, in the office and here in the studio at times. Uh, it's a mono price one. It retails for 400 bucks right now. It's uh, 289, but it's out of stock until early January. So it's possible that they are replacing it with something right you know, or it's just possible it's out of stock, but I will put a link to it in the show notes and in the, uh, in the chat room here for anybody that, that cares, but it's a, it's a 27 inch, uh, UHD display. They call it a 4k display. Um, but it, it, I really like this thing. It's, it's very well done. And it, for those of you that, that remembered my issues with it and the issues many of you had with other, uh, UHD displays, this one does not suffer from the doesn't wake up when you wake up your Mac problem. So yeah, I think that was a 10 bit versus an eight bit bus on the, on the data path on the, uh, on the display port cable or something. But anyway, it's all good. It's good stuff. So, um, yeah, uh, there you go. So yeah. Any questions, John, on that? Any thoughts to add on the screens and all that? Stuff? So wait, is UHD 4K? Is that the same thing? Yeah. Well, okay. Yeah. yeah yes. Sort of. Yes. <laughs> it, it, what, what's the resolution of 4K? Is that? Um, well, I think it's about 4K <laughs> in one direction. Well, right? yeah. Right. Oh, uh, wait. I just Googled it. Is UHD the same as 4K? Yeah. Well, Google it and you can find out yourself. Wh but, what's the answer? Well, it says uh, I'm doing a show. So you know. 4096 by 2160 is 4K. And so a UHD HD says it's a little less. A little less. 3840 by 2160. Huh. 3840 by 2160 is what this screen is. Yeah. So there you go. Yeah. Cool. 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 All right. Uh, yeah. Let's. Uh, so moving on. Good stuff. Hopefully. Uh, Hopefully that helps, Steve. Uh, while we're here, sure. Why not? Uh, Chuck wrote and said, uh, back in Mac Geek Up 735, Dave, you discussed the new iPhone's face recognition, and you said you were experimenting with the new iPhone 10R and promised you would circle back. He says, but uh, I hadn't heard you circle back. So... He uh, he shares a bunch of stuff here, which I will actually I'm just going to read Chuck's email because his thoughts on this uh, are certainly a good foundation for me to sort of wrap up my thoughts with the 10R. And uh, and I like the 10R. I'm going to I'm keeping it. It's it's a great phone, by the way. So uh, Chuck says you didn't have any. Thing positive to say about facial recognition, but I must have missed a discussion in a later MGG because I don't know what problems you're referring to. Uh, he says, I upgraded from a two-year-old iPhone 7 to the 10R, so this is my first experience with Face ID. He says, I find it is an improvement over Touch ID. He says, uh, if you remember, we exchanged emails a few years ago about the fingerprint scan not working consistently for those of you that use our hands a lot, e.g. Uh, potters and drummers. It says, so on my seven, I'd been using an eight digit passcode to sign in, completely skipping touch ID, giving up on the fingerprint uh, option for the last several years. It says, I find face ID fast and accurate. It can tell the difference between my brother and I, who are nearly twins or so I'm told. One quibble, he says, if I grab my iPhone the wrong end up, I have to turn it around. Um so he, he seems to like face ID. I, you know, my thoughts on face ID haven't really changed. They are, it, it's fine, but it sort of drives me crazy when I, um, like it, the, the kicker is in the car. If I tell the, the phone that I want to run ways, it's like, yeah, you got to unlock your iPhone first. It's like, yeah. So I don't want to look at the screen though, because I'm driving. You know, that kind of like, you know, that that that's where it's the most frustrating. And and there are times where it just doesn't unlock, you know, and then it's like oh, I'm fighting with the stupid thing or whatever. But it's fine. I mean, it whatever. It's the future of it. Right. So we just live with it. Um, back to Chuck. He says uh, regarding the 10R generally, he says, I'm very happy with this change. Me, too. He says the positives 
or that the battery life is much better. He says, if that's battery management software, a more efficient processor or more battery size, I don't know. It's all, all of those things, I believe. Chuck says, but I can go two days on a charge now if I want, whereas with my old, old phone, same apps and usage pattern, uh, I would make it barely through one day and I'd bought a battery pack just to avoid running out. It says with the 10 R, the only time I've come close to a one day cycle was on tour, constantly using cell data for maps, info searches and translation apps. And the battery seems to charge faster too, which makes sense. It's a little larger, so it will charge faster. It says the screen, screen size and clar- clarity is noticeably better than the iPhone 7. And it makes me wonder how I got on with the smaller form factor for all those years. And he says the processor is clearly faster. And because of that, AI feels faster as a result, which would be true. They did a lot in the 10, uh, especially the 10S and 10R series for all of all of that AI stuff. Uh um uh, scrolling through here he says uh and the one thing one last thing he says he likes about the 10r is that the memory option or storage option price points are better the seven required a jump from 32 to 128 with no option in between and a steep cost increase as a result he says the price for the 10r memory option to boost from 64 to 128 is reasonable and the capacity with no apps in the cloud is much more comfortable uh, so there you go yeah i am um, I, I've been very, very happy with the 10R as well. It took me a day to get used to not looking at an OLED screen because I came from a 10 to the 10R. So in that sense, I stepped down uh, on the screen alone. Everything else was a step up. But uh, on the screen alone, it was definitely you know a step down. But this this screen on, on here, whatever they call the liquid um, LCD or whatever it's called, uh, liquid retina, I guess they call it is fantastic. And once I got used to it, I got used to it and I don't even think about it anymore. So I've been really happy with the, with the 10 R and the battery life is just killer. It's so good. They, it's nice that Apple finally made a phone that has a decent battery in it. It's been, it's been a long time. So I'm pretty happy with it. It's a little bigger than I would like in my pocket at times, a little bit. Um, I, you know, I, I liked the size of the 10, that, that was a perfect size for me. Um, the 10 R is a little bit bigger, uh, which is nice at times, but also just a little funky in the pocket. So, so there you go for, I know several of you, uh, had emailed asking what my verdict was on the 10 R and it is thumbs up for sure. I've traveled with it a few times. I've been using it constantly and it's, it's outstanding. So it is the phone. It is the iPhone that I would say most people should get when it, it's nice that there's a phone now that I can, when somebody says, uh, oh, you know, which iPhone should I get? It's the 10 R. If you don't think you need a 10 S or the 10 S max, then great. Just get the 10 R. You're done. Good to go. Save a little money, get all the, you know, other than the OLED screen and get all the, all the bells and whistles. It's good. So thoughts on that, John. I like my eight. Yeah. Sure. At first, I didn't think it was. Uh, I think the, the the biggest motivation to upgrade from my seven, other than to just be one of the cool kids, was the, I think they call it True Tone. But yep. um, the display is much nicer because yeah, the, it does some sort of adaptive right stuff. And uh, so I, I, other than that, you know, there wasn't a heck of a lot difference between the eight and the seven i mean the thing i liked also was that you know i could still use my cases and stuff because it's the same right. form factor yeah it's not just part. true tone it i mean that's a much nicer display on the eight than the seven had it it's it oh, okay. just tech wise it's a it's a big step up and i agree with you like that like the eight i don't think there's that much of a difference on the display between the eight and the 10 r i think i think there's a little bit of of you know incremental improvement but but for the most part, yeah, I, I agree. That eight display is also spectacular. Yeah, yeah. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm hoping they bring back Touch ID, but I, I think I'm going to be disappointed. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you will be disappointed if uh, I mean, look at what they've done with the iPad, right? It's like clearly Touch ID is gone. Um, so there you go. Mm-hmm. And you know, I have to say, like, I, I, you get used to it. Like, like I said, there's, yeah. there's times where it's frustrating, but. You know, whatevs. Let's get past it. Yep. Um, we have a little bit of time left, and we've got a stockpile of cool stuff found here. So I'd like to try and get through at least all of these. I think there's actually only six of them that we've got. What do you think, John? You think we can do this? <clears throat> Blast off. Blast off. All right. First is from Taryn. Uh, 
I was trying to order photo books for Christmas. And of course, I found out that Apple was not doing that anymore. It's true. You can no longer do this uh, as of September 30th. That is it. Uh, he says, I'm on a 2011 MacBook Pro running El Capitan. So upgrading to the newest photos would have been a big time sink. I called Apple support and got this tip. Mimeo Photos is the service that Apple used to use for printing some of their book products. And they have an app extension available in the App Store for photos, right? But for those people that aren't running photos that are still running iPhoto, uh, they also have an online service for uploading a PDF of your project from legacy OSs. And he says, I tried it and it was super simple. Finish your project as normal in photos. Uh, but instead of clicking buy, press control buy and you will get a menu option for exporting a printing PDF. Save this to your Mac, then go to the Mimeo Photos homepage or uh, import.mimeophotos.com. Follow the instructions for uploading and verifying the document. You'll get a payment page and, of course, shipping information. And Terrence says, uh, uh, in Bermuda, it worked great because uh, Apple will arrange for Apple. Uh, sorry, Mimeo Photos lets you arrange for shipping to basically anywhere you want, not just your Apple IDs country. So... Great service, and I will put that in there uh, for anybody that's looking to do that. That's pretty cool. I like that they've. I actually like that they've abstracted it out, and they're no longer trying to manage that process. You just load an extension, oh. and you're done. I think it's good. Okay. Well, I'm going to throw something on the pile here, Dave. Go. You may have noticed I just put this in our document here. Apple has a handy dandy article titled "Create and Order Print Products in Photos with Project Extensions." Yep. And guess what? They mention. What we just mentioned, cool. along with um, all the other project extensions. So there's like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight nice. that they list explicitly, and you can get them in the App Store. That they, they tell you how to do all this. So well, uh, and what's cool is if you can do it with Shutterfly now, right? So you know, like Shutterfly was how we had been doing books for a long time because it's way cheaper than doing it the yeah, Apple way. That's one, on, that's one on the list. Yeah, I know it's great. So yeah, it's pretty cool. It's pretty cool. Yeah. Sweet. Thanks for finding that link, man. That's awesome. So cool. 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 All right. Uh, right. We're moving because we want to get there. Uh, Andrew says, Dave, I recall you mentioning actually Dave and John. He says, I recall you mentioning that you didn't like dark mode because of the mail and web browsing lack of controls. He says I came across this and it may resolve the web browsing issue darkreader.org it's a plugin for safari firefox and chrome and it allows you to take the white background of web pages and make it dark mode i do have to say in my short time messing with this new macbook air i immediately wanted dark mode on the whole thing like i can't stand it on my desktop on my imac but on the air i like it was the best thing so i i don't know if it'll last for me on the air but very interesting and very cool. Thank you for sharing uh, Dark Reader. That's a good one. That that solves that. It's just so jarring moving from, you know, something with mostly black background with white text and then, or not black, but dark background and white text to this, you know, oh, there's all this stuff. It looks cluttered. It's weird. I don't know. So anyway, there you go. Thank you, Andrew. Good stuff. Good, good stuff. Any thoughts on that, John? Have you, uh, have you messed, you've messed with dark mode. It's just... I like to live in the light. Okay. <laughs> fair. That's fair. Not the dark. I, 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 I'm not tempted by the dark side. Okay. All right. Well, that's fair. That's fair. I, mean, uh, I tried it and I'm like, yeah, for some people. Yeah. I mean, if you can't handle the contrast of uh, regular mode, then yeah, maybe dark modes for you. Did you try dark mode on your laptop or just on your on your larger screen on the Mac mini? Um, I mean, yeah, I tried it briefly on, on, on the, the Mac. I mean, I do have it change the background based on the time of day, which you mm. know isn't really dark mode, but it's, sure. you know, it's like after the screensaver. And that's, that's kind of yep. th th that I'll, I'll go for it, but yep. yeah. I don't know. I, I it just, maybe I'll give it another world, but it's just, uh, just isn't for me, but for some people, Hey, yeah. Yeah, I was I, I was shocked with how much I wanted it on the air. Like it gave me the choice and uh and I was like, "Oh no, I like I want I I I want the dark mode." I was flipped back and forth and was like, "No, no, no, this is this is what I prefer." Which which surprised me. 
So, all right, moving on to Mike. He says, you guys were talking about iPad keyboards in a recent episode. If you don't mind a Bluetooth keyboard that is separate from the iPad case, check out the iClever folding keyboard. I've had it since the summer. It's a tri-fold Bluetooth USB full-size keyboard that works with Mac, Windows, iOS, and Androids because it's just a Bluetooth keyboard. Uh, it says the keys light up in three changeable colors and brightnesses. I like the feel of it and the fact that it is a full-size keyboard that fits in my iPad case. It has a shortcut. It has shortcut keys at the top in the function key area, and it works really well. And the battery lasts a very long time. I just wanted to add another keyboard to the mix. Very cool. Thank you so much, Mike. That's great, man. Yeah, cool. I like that. I've seen. Uh, I haven't used one, but I've seen pictures of that folding keyboard, and that's pretty cool. How it it just folds up. It's pretty good. I like it. Thoughts on that, John? Before we move on, I clever. Why yeah. do they sound familiar? I I think I have an iClever rechargeable battery pack. Yeah, they make a, a pile of things. Huh, cool. All right, uh, Seth says, uh, in a recent episode, you discussed function keys and how they can be used to control specific actions depending on whether you hold the FN key and what settings you have enabled in your preferences. I use a couple of applications regularly for work that are heavily dependent on function keys being used in their function mode. I'm on a MacBook Air, and when I'm in most applications in the Finder, I prefer to, the keys to act in non-function mode. But in certain apps, I want the reverse. A while back, I found a, a while back I found a utility on GitHub, GitHub called Fluor, F L U O R. It installs a menu item which allows you to set a general default behavior and then default behaviors by application. So when I switch to the requisite app, I can use the function keys in their function format without having to press the function key and without resetting the general system level preference setting. That's pretty cool, Seth. Thanks, thanks for sending that along. That's awesome. Cool. I like it. Makes life easier. That's why we do the stuff that we do. Thoughts on that, John, before we move on? Moving on. Moving on. All right. Brian uh, has one to share. He says, uh, you recently mentioned that you had an old HP scanner slash printer, and you didn't know if the scanner software would work in future Mac OS releases. Heck, I don't know if it'll work in the current release. I'm just lucky that it does. I, I think if I tried to install it fresh, it wouldn't install. I think it only works on my one iMac in the office because I've upgraded it from a, a, an OS that did work. It's a LaserJet 3055, by the way. Uh, but Brian continues, you might check out ViewScan, V-U-E-S-C-A-N from Hamrick, H-A-M-R-I-C-K dot com. I have had really good luck with very old scanners and their software. Also, you find a list of scanners they can support on their homepage. I did check, and sadly, my LaserJet 3055 is not supported on Mac OS, only on Windows with ViewScan. So, uh, so there you go. I, you know, I, I mean, I guess I could run a VM either. I, I could run a VM and run an old version of Mac OS that did it. It's very in, infrequent that I need to scan with this thing, but it's super handy, and I'm not going to replace it until the printer part dies or some part of it dies that matters. So, but very cool. Thank you. Uh, Thank you for sending that in. That's good. Hopefully it helps somebody out there. I like, I like third party stuff that takes over where uh, first party stuff kind of gives up. So pretty good. Any thoughts on that, John, before we move on to the last one here? <laughs> my GCC laser burner still works. Is it really? That thing's older than my kids, man. That's pretty good. Wow. It has a 10 base T ethernet. Not even 100, but Whoa. 10 base T, which was fine, but it's a 1200 DPI. Sure. But it supports both PostScript and PCL. So, <laughs> yeah, okay. That makes sense. So, having, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah having a standard uh, uh, PD uh, page description language yeah. is, uh, is a benefit versus. It's funny though. The, the, what do you have again? It's a laser. It's, a, it's, a, it's an all in one. It's a laser jet 3055. It's a scanner. A printer and a you know a, a copier if you want it to be or a fax machine or whatever you know because it's got the scanner. So the, the issue, to, so the issue that you had was you you you're unable to access the scanning feature. Correct. It's a network device and okay. uh, all right. So it's a, so it's, it's some proprietary thing. Yes. I mean the printing thing. Yes. No printing think, printing works natively from Mac OS. No problem. Right. And, well, yeah. PCL. Right? Uh, either PCL or PostScript. It's a laser oh, printer. Both. 
So it's probably both. Yeah. Uh, but no, the scanning part is the one where it's very tenuously um, still working. So, yeah. All right. Uh, last one is actually in the Mac Geek Cab forums and is probably not for everyone, but we were talking in the forums about finding things on your network. Uh, now that Safari hides or does no, no longer offers the op opportunity to display uh, bonjour devices, printers, you know, uh, other computers or whatever you want to see that advertises itself via bon bonjour. Tildesoft, T-I-L-D-E-S-O-F-T dot com uh, was recommended by data for nothing and bits for free in the forums because they have a piece of software called bonjour browser. Uh, it does work, but I believe it's only 32 bit, so it may not work for a long time, but it still works in Mojave. So certainly usable for now, and maybe somebody will take over at some point. So. Good stuff. We didn't get through half the stuff that I wanted to get through today, John, but that's, you know, that's how it goes and when, when we get together. Oddly enough, yes, it's running on one of my machines, not the other, but another... Bonjour, or ZeroConf, I think is another name for it. Yep. Uh, client is called Flame. Ah. Now, it's funny because I just tried to launch it. When I try to launch it on my MacBook Pro, it crashes and doesn't run. But I okay. just launched it on my Mini. So that's another. And there's oh. also a version on iOS as well. Interesting. Huh. Yeah, I like running the... Yeah, and it shows you... Yeah, so I'm looking here and basically pretty much displays all your devices. Yeah, that, yeah. Uh, cool talk bonjour yeah 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 and you say it'll work on the mac too as uh, right there's a yes so i'm running it right now on my mac mini and okay. then it's showing me all my most of my network devices not all of them because i guess not everything talks bonjour because well right too, yeah no right but it's showing my computers it shows all my nas devices it shows my tivo uh it shows my uh denon uh speaker yeah so huh. Most stuff it's it's displaying here. My Apple TV, my AirPlay. Look at that. Yeah. I think doesn't iStumbler show Bonjour stuff too? Um, it used to. I don't know. I just you know throwing it out there. I don't. Uh, do I have iStumbler on this computer? I do. I don't know if I have the latest version on this iMac up here in the studio because I don't use it all that regularly and hopefully I don't break anything. Yeah, there it's got a Bonjour browser. There you go. So uh, yeah. Yeah. Good. Yep. Yep. iStumbler's a handy piece of software, man. Pretty good stuff. All right, folks, we told you how to find us, at least via the emails. But if you want to call us, you can call 224-888-Geek, which John is 433. We casually mentioned our Mac Geek Gab forums. It is rocking over there. Come and join us. MacGeekGab.com slash forums. Great little home for us all to hang out in. It's uh, it's luscious. We're really, really liking it. And thanks to everybody that's really participating and hanging out. Thanks to Cashfly for providing all the bandwidth to get the show from us to you. Thanks to all of our sponsors, of course, Eero at Eero.com slash MGG. OpsGenie at OpsGenie.com, of course, from Atlassian. Ring at Ring.com slash MGG. Barebones Software at Barebones.com. Jamf Now at Jamf.com slash MGG. Otherworld Computing at oh, MaxSales.com. I got ahead of myself. And Smile at SmileSoftware.com slash podcast. And thanks to you for listening. Truly. John, you got us into this mess today. How can you get us out? How can I get us out? I could give you the key. Oh, we need the I key. I could give you a combination. Yes. I could give you the secret password. Ooh. Boris has the or, microfilm. Is that it? <laughs> Boris and Natasha. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, there's a lot happening with Russia these days. Um, but anyways, to close things out here, no matter what form of identification or authentication you use, you want to make sure that you don't get caught. Made up.